completely. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining today. I got my co-host, of course, Brian the Beast Robinson, and we have action ninja movie director royalty, Sam Furstenberg, who made so many great canon films back in the day that we all remember. Thanks for joining, Sam. Ah, I'm so happy to be here with you guys. I think it's the second time I was with you a few times, David, before. Yeah, we had a great interview. Yeah, yep. but maybe this is the first time alive, so uh, I'm so happy to be here, and uh, let's see what kind of questions you guys have. I'll be happy to answer. Oh, definitely. Uh, we got a comment right here from Movie Nader. He says, greetings from Germany. Sam is a master of ninja movies. <laughs> well, it so happened. I, a master, I don't know, but it so happened that I did direct few movies which were on the, on the subject or the ninja subject. To, that's correct. Definitely. And I believe Revenge of the Ninja was the first action movie you ever directed, correct? That's that's absolutely correct. You know, there was a, in uh, Los Angeles, in Hollywood, there was a company, Canon Film. And Canon Film, uh, for some, for few reasons, and uh, made a movie which was called Enter the Ninja. Mm -hmm. The idea to make a ninja movie Rather, the, uh, rather than reg regular, so I called regular martial art, was an idea by Mike Stone. Mike Stone is a famous martial artist. He was a champion. And Bruce he Lee came movie to Ken Bruce Lee's movie? Was he in a Bruce Lee movie, Mike He Stone? was in some yeah. movies, but he, you know, he won a couple of championships here in, it's, uh, in the 70s, I think. I think he dated Elvis Presley's wife, too. <laughs> that's, got interesting it's interesting. a gossip uh, part. yeah he was uh, he was uh, very friendly and I think he was training Elvis and his wife Priscilla yes which ended up with a romantic uh, situation <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so, so the story goes <laughs> uh, yeah Mike is writing a book now I think but oh. uh, yes so he came up to McKinnon and said okay let's take let, let's have a, a switch uh, a little switch on, on this uh, martial art movie and it will be a ninja and uh, ninjas were, uh, uh, as I understand it, uh, familiar with the, in the uh, familiar and famous with the, within the Japanese mythology of martial art. But the, the ninja character was always a negative character within it. So it was not a samurai. The samurais were uh, honorable fighters. The ninja were dirty fighters. Sure. And uh, so they uh, they appeared in movie in Hong Kong movies and in Japanese movies, but usually in a negative uh, connotations. And here came Mike Stone and said, let's turn it around. Let's make a hero. <laughs> and and Canon, the company, bought the idea and they produced a movie which was called uh, Enter the Ninja. Franco Nero was the good guy. And within this movie, uh, and Mike Stone was the choreographer. He was involved. He wrote the script and he was involved. He, he was the choreographer of the, of the fight sequences. And he brought in to play the protagonist, the antagonist, the bad guy, he brought in a guy called Shokasugi, a Japanese uh, uh, master uh, with a lot of uh, titles and uh, and trophies. <laughs> and uh, and Sho was the, the bad guy, Franco Nero was the good guy, and it was a good movie. The movie was uh, had quite a, a, a success. And uh, and the company came on, they wanted, and it was directed by Menachem Golan, which was the head of the company. Sure. And and uh, and the company wanted to do uh, another a sequel immediately. Mm -hmm. what, what they realized that uh, Franco Nero was not a martial artist, and, and uh, you know, it, uh, I, it didn't look too good on the on the on the fight screen, yeah. and on sure. the <laughs> But they like Shokasugi very much. Of course, Shokashugi is a, is a master of, mm -hmm. of what he's doing in the martial arts. So they wanted to, to switch it around and, have, and create a movie where Sho will be the hero of the movie, Shokasugi. Uh, Menachem Golan, that uh, directed the first movie, did not want to direct the second movie, the sequel. He was very busy with his company, with running okay. the company, for, or whatever reason. I just finished a movie for them, for the company, which was not an action movie. Uh, the name of the movie is One More Chance, dramatic movie. But they figured out, I guess, you know, this young guy that uh, inspires to be a director, wants to be a director, he can put the movie together. He can put mm -hmm. the beginning, middle, end, 
makes sense, you know, he knows what he's doing, maybe. So they turn to me and they say, would, would you, you, you know, would you take it upon yourself to direct this movie? Which they already had the title, Revenge of the Ninja. Shokasugi was already signed before I came in. And, and of course, I, I'm a young director and I say, why not? And I, 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 I love action movies in general very much since childhood. Not necessarily martial art only, but general action movies. I always loved. Um, sure. People take an example. Let's say James Bond. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, <clears throat> so of course, they they did have some doubt about me. How would I ha handle action sequences? Because directing a movie, dialogue, people talking is one thing, but putting together action sequences, another another thing. But I kind of was uh, trying to assure them that it will be okay, don't worry, despite the fact that I didn't have any idea <laughs> how I will do it. But, uh, you know, I, I, I studied film. I went to school. I, I, I knew enough about film. I was an assistant director for five years. And, um, okay. Yeah, I, you know, if, if you, you were confident you could pull it off, even though no, you haven't correct. done action. If, if one yeah, understands yeah. the language, the cinematic language, they can do it together. The okay. cinematic language you, it doesn't mean you can put together a comedy, but but uh, you know cinema, mm -hmm. putting a, and and so and that's how it fell upon my shoulder. You write to direct. It was the first time, and it was the first time I encountered martial art because I have never seen a Hong Kong movie before I met Shokasugi. Mm. Any martial art, what you we used to call karate movie or kung fu movie, I never saw. I, I've seen a lot of samurai movies, Japanese samurai movies, but not. And the, Sam, did you did was was that a little bit of a? Uh, were you a little fear maybe there about having to direct the fight scenes? Did you have to rely a lot on like a fight choreographer to kind of, you know, show you the right angles and how to really bring out the excitement of the? So absolutely, uh, absolutely right. I knew in my mind right away from the beginning I will have to recruit a good stunt coordinator. And I learned very quickly that I have Shokasugi next to me. He's an expert of martial art and martial art movies. Not only martial art, he already participated, but he he or he was around already with the Chuck Norris gang and the, the whole group. And so I knew right away that I have two. And, and I brought, we brought along uh, a son coordinator, Steve Lambert, which is martial artist or was martial artist by himself. So I already felt comfortable because I see, okay, I'm surrounding myself with the two good people. Mm -hmm. One will, will take care of all, will, will teach me, will show me everything that I need to do to know about uh, martial art. And another one will show me and teach me everything I need to know about stunt and, and action, putting together action. I, all, I all also recruited the, the same cameraman, the same camera, uh, the same cinematographer that... Uh, uh, did the, the movie uh, Enter the Ninja? So I know. Okay, I have somebody with more with experience oh, here. Okay, nice. And I had the same yeah. editor of the Enter the Ninja, Michael Duffy. So David Gorfinkel was a cinematographer, and Michael Duffy. So I had a good group surrounding me. So putting aside, the, I guess that that's a good thing. Maybe putting aside your ego and pretending you know everything. Oh yeah, you had the right team for a, sure. With a good crew. But you're right. You're absolutely right. That that's that that this was the plan. This was the. Now, was the production in general pretty smooth, or did you find a lot of challenges with that Revenge of the Ninja? No, the 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 uh, production was extremely smooth. We, uh, because of some uh, uh, financial reason, we went and we were filming in Salt Lake City, Utah. The the movie, one. Uh, 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 one of the demand that we needed from the script was the two twin towers because the, 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 it was already in the script. The script was written by uh, James Booth, by uh, uh, not by James Booth. Uh, so th this was already uh, Jim Silk was the was the writer of the script, and the uh, two towers, uh, residential towers or office towers, were part of the script already. So we were looking for this, and it's cheaper. Mm -hmm to shoot a film outside Los Angeles. Uh, and we found Salt Lake City. Utah Film Commission was very uh, helpful. And right away from the preparation, we prepared a lot. 
I, I'm not, I was not foreign to movies. I, I was assistant director for five or six years prior to this. I, I went to school, undergraduate, graduate in film schools, and I worked in a lot of movies. So I, I, I was assistant director. I understand how you prepare a movie, how you, how you put it to, together, the preparation. So location scouting. We prepared all the fight sequences ahead of time. I storyboarded, I had a storyboard artist with me and every action sequence was storyboarded together with Shokasugi, together with Steve Lambert. So it, the map was already there before the first minute of shooting. Nice. Dialogue sequences are not, not, not a big deal to, to, to film, that, that, mm -hmm. uh, that's easy. So because we were so prepared and we had a good special effect team, you need a good special effect team when you do action movies. And, uh, and, and there were action teams. Shokasugi had a team of his students, I think six or seven students with him all the time on the set on, in Utah. And Steve Lambert had a, a, a group of uh, four or five stunt people with us in Utah. So all, everything was already delegated ahead of time and everybody knew exactly what he, what he needs to do, etc. And besides, I knew already that the, the right way to do it from production point of view is to shoot action sequence, then go to dialogue, relax, mm -hmm. uh, rest, let the stunt people, let the action people rest and prepare the next one. And after a few days with dialogue sequences, back to action for a few days, back to uh, dialogue. So this staggering dialogue, uh, action, dialogue, action helps a lot in, in helping to make it smooth. But we had no problem. Uh, the only thing, the only thing that when we, we finished the movie, we edited the entire movie and then uh, with, together with consultation with the writer and the producers, of course, we have decided that we need to shoot more action stuff uh, and the rest. And so we got another week edition a week and we did the opening sequence the big action opening sequence of revenge of the ninja but in los angeles we didn't go back to utah oh okay interesting so that wasn't even part of the film initially no. um until yes. after the fact what a, what a great addition uh yes, yes there are so many great comments and questions in here we're going to try to dig into as many of these as we can if anybody wants to 100 percent make sure your comment or question is read though uh do one of the super chats uh donations are always welcome but let's start with our favorite commenter here antonio uh he says mr sam you've directed an incredible range of genres from action to comedy to drama which genre do you find the most challenging challenging and why okay that's a very good question because cinema has many genres and i have entered cinema not in particular to do action movies i entered this business because i love telling stories through visual means because i fell in love with cinema when i was a kid or for whatever other reason i have decided that i would become a storyteller a visual, I will call, let's say, a visual storyteller. So, of course, there are tons of genres. And, for example, we mentioned comedy. So you need a specific talent, comedian talent, to make a, to, to make a comedy, which I decided right away I don't have. I'm not for comedy, so I'm not. But from the entire, I would say, gamut of movie making, action is the most challenging for all type of movie making. Because in, in uh, making action movies, of course, there are dialogue scenes. There are exposition, there are conflicts. You need all of this to, to flesh out the heroes, the good guy, the bad guy, the romantic uh, relationship, so on and so on. But then, as a director, you have then to approach the action part of the movie, the action sequences. Action sequences, you go back to silent cinema. In action sequence, you go back. Now you have to tell a story without one word, nothing, only with visual effects, with no explanation. So if, if I say, because sometimes I see action sequences that have no meaning, so I call. But if you follow my philosophy that every action sequence has a little story, every action sequence is a little movie by itself, 
that had a beginning, a middle, and a resolution, and it's compelling, and it's interesting, then you have to create a story with visual means only, no words in it, and make it exciting. And, Sam, and, were and you sure. were you really influenced by the silent films? Then did they they really inspire you? Yeah, you know, as a film student, you are uh, usually in film school. You are exposed to all kind of of cinema. Uh, take me, I was very influenced by Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin has action sequences within his movies. You know, even if, will it be only a, there is a little, uh, in one of his movies, a little sequence in a shopping center on, on, on rollerblades. And he's uh, blinded. He's, uh, and it's an it's a entire action sequence on rollerblade, a comical one, of course, because it was Charlie Chaplin. But definitely, of course, I saw Birth of a Nation. I saw Intolerance. I saw all the, 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 the big uh, action movies. Uh, uh, so-called action movies, uh, but silent and very fascinating. And so, so of course, you know, of course I was influenced one way or another by, the, by those silent movies somehow, I'm sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, here's a really cool question. A Anchonio, uh, Mr. Sam, your film Break Two Electric Boogaloo became a cultural phenomenon. What was the most memorable moment from filming that movie? <laughs> That's a good question. Okay, let's see. Let, let me try. Number one, let me mention there is not a big difference, not really from a professional point of view between dance movie and action movie. In both of them, though it looks like they're, they're, it's, they're a world apart, you know, in one hand you have uh, action, violence, uh, explosion, dead people, etc. In the other hand, you exactly the opposite, but to put together a sequence, dance sequence, and to put together an action sequence from a cinematic point of view, it's very similar, very, very similar. So there is a choreographer in both, both cases. Choreographer puts the fight together or the dance together, and then the director has to do his interpretation to interpret it. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, breaking, uh, breaking to Electric Boogaloo was a lot of fun because I was in another territory, no violence, no explosion, no cars turning around, <laughs> but yet, yet dealing with, the, with music and dance all day long. And, uh, I, you know, the, the biggest, I, I'm trying to think, we didn't have anything, you know, major challenge, but the biggest sequence uh, uh, seen in uh, Breaking to Electric Bulo is the final concert. There is a final concert at the end of the movie, about 12 minutes, that includes a lot of dance and tons of uh, 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 atmosphere people, extras, what we call extra atmosphere, about 3,000 mm -hmm. people in the street. So as a director wow. to deal with six, then you need like five, six cameras together. Uh, usually when, when there are so many extras, we are losing them. They lose patience. You know, they, they come in, they think it's very exciting to make movies. Then they find out that it's a tedious work. <laughs> movies and kind of after four or five hours, you start to lose them. And they leave. So dealing with this amount of huge amount of extras on the streets and huge amount of dancers on the stage at the same time, this was probably the most challenging, uh, the, fi the final sequence of the movie. Okay, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Here's a really cool question from RMJ Movie Reviews. How does Sam feel about soft PG-13 action films versus the hard R action films of the 80s and 90s with political incorrectness? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good. This is a good one. Of course, yeah. listen, there, is, there are action fans. Not everybody goes and see action movies. I meet people in the world, uh, you know, I, I, I've been around for many years. I, when I go and I meet people, I talk with them about me. There are people in the world that do not see action movies. Majority of this group is women. They, women don't tend to see, go and see violent action movies. The, the, the other group, even among male uh, viewers, I see people who have never seen an action movies. They have no interest in action movies. They don't. So they, when I talk with them about even famous action movies, they have no no knowledge. You know, 
Schwarzenegger, Stallone, they don't know because they don't watch action. But mm. let's go now to the, to the crowd, to the target crowd. There is crowd who love, which loves action movies. Now, as a producer, as a director, when you make a movie which is aimed to this target audience, we call them target audience, you better deliver. You give them what they want to see. Because why are they coming? Why are they paying the money? Because they love hardcore action. They love violence. They love very exciting, elaborated, very uh, like danger uh, situations. And I believe you better deliver. If this is the type of movie you want. If maybe there is a market for soft action, what you call soft PG-13. I was not involved in this market and I don't know. But uh, maybe the, nin the Ninja Turtles was this type of a movie. Uh, there is some kind of an uh, uh, there is an action, but the action is not violent, mm -hmm. and and maybe yeah that uh, fit kids. I was not in this market, and uh, and uh, it so happened historically that I was involved in the movies of the eighties and the nineties, which we created a very harsh. Uh, you know, I was uh, my movies were always X rated. I had to cut them down to get to get to the R rating. Oh, and now a lot of people, there are a lot of fans who are looking for the pieces that we had to cut out. Uh, uh, every decapitation, I had the decapitations in movies I had to cut out. I had rolling heads on the floor we had to cut out to get the R rating. But I believe it has to be there because for this target audience, they come to see this kind of excitement. It's some kind of a release. I do not believe that uh, violence in movie breeds violence in the street. I don't believe in it. No. No. I believe that yeah. violence in the movie is a release valve for mm -hmm. all kinds of inner, you know, inner instinct that we have from way back when we were still cavemen. And <laughs> instead of <laughs> going out and killing people, we watch movies nowadays. So uh, people, you know, they, they like this thr thrill and that, that, that's where I was involved. And, and mind you, to add to, to your question, Everything we executed in our movies would, without special effects, without digital effects, without cables, flying people in, everything was physically executed. Every stunt that you see in any of the movies that I directed is physically executed. A lot harder to make movies back then, a lot less safe, but it, it does capture that, you know, there's definitely a different quality for sure. Cause that stuff was really happening in the real world. And you guys filmed it. Um, is there any chance of some of these films getting re-released as like unrated versions? Like, do you still have that footage of the heads rolling the decapitations yeah. and everything? No, no, we ran into, we have an historical problem here. Canon film, which was the company that produced those movies went bankruptcy at one mm -hmm. time. It was an independent movie a company. It was not a studio. In a studio, which we call the, the big studios, the major studios, everything is organized. All the films are stored. Uh, everything is in vaults, etc. So if you look for a universal movie, you will find every piece of it. Okay. But Canon was an independent movie. did not have storage space, did not have anything. So when the movie went bankrupt, Various companies took possession of the movies, or, which was part of settlement. They owed the money. They were creditors. I don't know what whatever it was there. All the movies that I directed, it so happened that they went to MGM. MGM mm -hmm. was a big creditor. Okay, so all the movies I directed for Canon were, ended up in MGM. Now, Canon had. They had around town warehouses with wardrobe from the movies, with props, and I guess also the outtakes of the movies. But once a company went, goes bankrupt, you know, the scenario, I'm, I'm imagining this scenario, the, warehouse, the, the owner of the warehouse, if he's not paid one month, two months, three months, eventually he takes everything and throws it out into garbage cans, uh, garbage bins outside his uh, warehouse. So my... I presume that that's what happened to most of the stuff of Canon wardrobe, okay. including wardrobe, uh, 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 props, and, and all the negatives, the original. Now, there is something which is called the cut negative. Once the editor is finished, they are cutting the negative, maybe more than one version. And that's what ends up in the, day, in the hands of MGM. So, for instance, in 
In the movie Ninja Tree The Domination, there was a sequence of Shokasugi backstory. Hmm. That we, we, Shokasugi with his family in clan, clan in Japan before, they come to, before he comes to America. And when we edited the movie, we decided to only use part of it as a flashback. He has a flashback at some point in the movie, and there is a short part of this entire sequence. Mm -hmm. A lot of fans were looking for this sequence, and eventually we had some connection in the MGM, in the editorial department of MGM, and we asked them, can you find, is it anywhere? And they went back to their vaults, to the MGM vaults, and they told us, all we have is the cut, the finished negative. The only negative mm -hmm. that we have is the cut version. The outtake, whatever you guys did not use, did not end up in our hand. We don't know where it is. So... If there is a chat, no, so here and here and there, people find European versions of the movie, because what happens sometimes, sometimes the movie we finish uh, cutting the movie, and there is a process from this negative. Usually they create what is called interpositive, and another internegative. It's a process in the lab. So sometimes when we finished editing the movie and we send the movie to the board of, uh, to get the rating, meantime, they already created internegative for Italy, let's say, for the Italian uh, uh, distributor or for the, the German distributor. And then we had to cut a couple of scenes out, but in the foreign, what we call the foreign, the European or the uh, uh, Far East version, you find things that we don't find in the movies that we have here. here. So, yes, here and there we find stuff. And actually, uh, I'm involved now in uh, uh, restoring a movie which is called American Samurai. Maybe you'll get to it. And, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And the man who helps me, uh, Lyle Goodwin, he found two versions of the movie. And he, he one European, uh, and already DVD. We're talking about DVDs. He found a DVD, a European DVD, and um, and. Uh, so we, what we call domestic, which North America DVD, and combining, so there was a decapitation, and he found the decapitation in the European version, not in the domestic version. Okay. So that's interesting. So here and there we find pieces, including Revenge of the Ninja. There was some violence in Revenge of the Ninja that we had to cut out, mm -hmm. but you find those little bits and, uh, and pieces in, in, uh, in the European or but it, it, it's a matter of a little bit of a research to find it. Uh, there was a decapitation in Revenge of the Ninja. Uh, there was the little boy getting a shuriken in his head. Those <laughs> kind of things we had to cut out because they don't allow violence against children in America. But Yeah, uh, for sure. That's an interesting so scene. <laughs> the, so the, the answer is, will never, to the best of my knowledge, it might pop up one day, who knows? We'll never be able to restore fully to what we wanted to do or, or the scenes that we just took out and we didn't use in the movie. Would you I ever think, think about redoing those scenes and putting them in? <laughs> that's, a, that's a noble idea. <laughs> here's, a, here's a comment. Speaking of, uh, you mentioned Eastern Europe. Uh, movie Nader, he says, I saw American Ninja in the cinema in Serbia in 1985 when I was nine years old. I've been a big ninja fan ever since. Thanks, Sam. Thank you for being fan, uh, fan, uh, such a fan of the movie. And I know, and I know for a fact that in some places in Eastern Europe they did not allow to show those movies. So those movies were not in cinema. The only way people could see them were bootleg cassettes, uh, you know, VHS cassettes. So I met people in Poland. I went to film festival in Poland and in. in other places. I was also in Serbia, in a film festival in Serbia. Oh, speaking and, of and, Poland. And I heard stories from the people uh, that they they used to see it at the same age, nine year old, but on yeah, a sure. cassette <laughs> that came from Western Germany. Well, they, somehow they got, there was a way to sn uh, smuggle in uh, the uh, illegal cassettes. Sure. Definitely yeah, American that's... Ninja. American Ninja was banned. The, the the idea that the title already was bad in the Eastern already that American was American Ninja funny. was bad. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Poland, uh, Steiner Arch he says, "Dear Mr. Sam, thank you so so much for your life work. Do you still have any ties to Poland?" Okay, I I I, I was born in Poland, so you can say I'm Polish. 
Okay. But I left the country, <laughs> you can say I left when I was four months old. So my parents left Poland. They didn't want to be in a communist country, to, uh, to continue in a communist country. They left. I was four months old. I grew up in Jerusalem, <laughs> in Israel. So I don't have ties. I don't have family or ties in Poland at all. I understand very, very, very little Polish, very little. Maybe some memories from my childhood, but I did not use the language. <coughs> Sorry. But a few years ago, I was invited to Gdansk, to a film festival in Gdansk. Mm -hmm. And I was there. They, they showed some American Ninja Adam. And my, to my surprise, to my surprise, while walking in the street and hearing Polish all the time, more and more words and phrases kind of made sense to me. So maybe the language is way back on my brain somewhere and it needs awakening. Yeah. So this was very strange. The more I was walking in the street and, and hearing and listening to Polish, the more I understood what they're saying. Every day I, I understood more and more. This was very interesting phenomenon. So this is my only connection to Poland. That, that's interesting because my mother's from Germany and I spent a lot of time as a child there and I spoke <laughs> German, but now I forget it. But then all of a sudden I hear things and words will come out and it's, mm -hmm. I don't know where they come from. They come from somewhere or hidden far away. It's the same thing for me, for me with Polish. <laughs> same thing. Mm. Oh, here's a, here's a question from Antonio. Uh, Ninja three, the domination is a unique blend of martial arts and supernatural elements. What inspired the creative direction of this film? Uh, listen, Anthony and everybody, when we started, when we made this movie, the beginning, it had no direction at all. There, was, <laughs> there were some circumstances that dictated what happened. And here is the story. It's a good story. We finished the movie Revenge of the Ninja with Shoka Sugi, and uh, we completed the movie, music, everything. Now, at the time, the, the economy of the 80s was working like this, of the movie. There were many independent companies, Corelco, Canon, other companies, many, many, many. And they made, they made, made movies. Their dream was that a, a major company will pick up the movie for distribution. Now, it's very hard to convince one of the major, Universal, Fox, 20 Cent, uh, Fox, uh, uh, Paramount, Warner, it's very hard to convince them to pick up a movie for distribution that they did not uh, produce. But they can distribute better than anybody else because they have the connection, they have the money. So this was the dream of every company. Can they uh, convince uh, one of the studios to release one of their movies, independent movies? Canon was trying and trying and trying and was not successful. When we had Revenge of the Ninja, they showed it around and MGM liked the movie. And MGM picked it up for distribution. So this was the first time for Canon. Canon was a young company. This was the first movie for Canon that a major distribution company picked up a movie and took it out. Uh, uh, MGM took out uh, Revenge of the Ninja in style. They, they created beautiful poster. People are familiar with this red poster, Shokasugi flying in the sky. This was created by MGM. Huge campaign, radio, television campaign. They opened the movie with uh, <clears throat> like 800 prints on the, what they used to call East Coast, and they then moved the 800 print to the West Coast. Good distribution, and the movie had a success. Mm. Relatively, I mean, it's not a James Bond, Obviously, but relatively, it has a success for for the for such a uh, low budget independent movie. So mm -hmm. obviously, what do the Canon wants? What do they want to do? They want to make another another sequel right away, because we are making money. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, uh, Menachem Kolan, the head of the company, calls me in, and Jim Silk, the writer, and he said he wants to make another movie. The company wants to make a sequel. But for some reason, which until today, I don't know the answer, they did not want Shokasugi to be featured as the hero of the movie. Hmm. I don't know if they had a financial dispute. I don't know what happened until today. Maybe Sho will tell us one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he probably is not giving a podcast. Uh, maybe he will tell us. <laughs> but anyway, they, didn't want, they wanted something different. Now, at the time, there were like, big, like some success to movies with the 
with the female heroes, with the heroine uh, Sigonia Weaver, uh, Flesh Dance, you know, it was a, a wave of success. So mm-hmm. Menachem Golan said, let's, let's make a movie with a woman, with an actress, rather than an actor, as a hero. But for me, what do I care? It's, uh, <laughs> I'm a higher director. It's a company. The company makes a decision. And, and it's quite a challenge. So, um, you know, I told him, okay, let's do it. <clears throat> Sorry. So it was decided. Then, but Shoka Sugi was still involved in the movie. May, he had a deal with them for two movies, I guess. So they still wanted him in the movie, but not in the main hero part. Mm. So, uh, and, and yet, you know, Shoka Sugi is the master. You know, Shoka Sugi is sure. the brain. Shoka Sugi is behind Ninja. We need him on the set to, to make a good <laughs> ninja movie, okay? So we presented to him the idea, and he didn't like the idea at all. Uh, obviously, mm. the, the first reason is he was upset. How come such a successful movie, and they don't want to repeat the same formula that he's the hero? Uh, we just finished with Revenge of the Ninja was such a success in the box office. And secondly, he told us, you know, a woman ninja will not work. Uh, <laughs> there is no such a thing. Now, the truth is, from what I've, I've seen, by then I already knew about Hong Kong movies because Sho Kasugi introduced me to the Hong Kong cinema, uh, mm-hmm. martial arts cinema. So I knew that here and there, here and there in the movies, you would see a female ninja, but always as evil, evil groups, bunch of uh, women who are mm-hmm. coming and sowing all kinds of troubles, but never ninja woman by herself in the leading part. So we had a conundrum here. We, we, we wanted him very much in the movie. He vetoed the idea. He said, I'm not going to participate in such a movie. And we didn't know how to come up. What, what should we do? So Jim Silk and myself, the writer and myself, at some point we came up with this idea that the woman, the leading uh, uh, character of the movie, she will be possessed by a ninja spirit. Hmm. She is not really a ninja. Behind her, there is a ninja with an adversary with Shokasuki. They are at odds with each other, but he dies. And his spirit is embedded in her. His spirit transferred to her. That's a, yeah. that's a poltergeist idea, you know, or, or uh, uh, any of those horror movies, idea that a spirit transfer from one person to another. And now she's fighting on behalf of the dead ninja. So it's not her powers. And eventually, at the end of the movie, somehow the spirit will go back to the dead ninja and the final fight will be between Shokasugi that he has to re- he has to save her. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, a, you know, exorcism type of a thing. Get the, the spirit, get the ghost, the spirit out of her and fight his adversary, the bad ninja. So uh, Shokasugi agreed to this idea. So this was the beginning. We had to start from, there was no script. So we had to start from this point and move on. And mm. uh, Jim Silk, the writer, he wrote this script. And since we were already there, and since Poltergeist, uh, The Exorcist was fam- was uh, popular, The Poltergeist was popular, Flesh Dance was popular, uh, Aliens was popular. So we kind of combined elements from all those movies together with our ninja <laughs> ninjas ideas. And that's how we came up with this hybrid type of a movie that has all kinds of genres mixed together. Now, at first, when we finished the movie, the movie looked very odd. I must admit that it did not have the same success of Revenge of the Ninja in the box office, in popularity. Mm. It did not reach the popularity of Revenge of the Ninja. So Shokasugi was right, eventually. You know, we must sure. have to admit that he was right. But... Strangely enough, through the years, 40 years later, 30 years, yeah, this year is 40 years later. Wow. And uh, yeah, the movie is from 84. Now we are 24. Uh, 1984. And it became a cult movie. Somehow, the cult <laughs> audience, the people who are looking for strange movies, they have adapted this movie. And it became like uh, the same group of the, the the room or the or the know, all of those cult movies that are usually playing at twelve o'clock at midnight in in small theaters around the country. Actually, I uh, there is a screening in Canada next month. I was asked to, oh, wow. to do an introduction. 
a screening of a 40 years anniversary a screening in Canada, uh, in Toronto, uh, Ninja Tree, the domination. So it became a cult movie. And uh, yeah, I, it, it's hard pr to predict. I would tell you 40 years ago, I would not imagine in my wildest dream that uh, this movie will survive and, and will become uh, uh, a favorite of uh, the cult audience. I think that's yeah. true of uh, Star Trek too, right? I, I don't think it was such a big series until later. Like it started blowing up, blowing up, and it just, you never knew like something absolutely like that. For, no, absolutely right. For the first 10 years, the movie was forgotten. You know, it played in the theater when the VHS cassette, and then it was forgotten, and nobody ever asked me about it, and nobody mentioned. And then, as you say, 12 years later, like 20 years ago, I, I started to see it blooming and coming up and more and more and more and screenings and I'm invited. And then I was invited to film festivals where they're showing it. And here in downtown, there is a club here in downtown LA uh, uh, called the Secret Movie Club. They had a screening and I went to the screening and people came out dressed as ninjas and they know all the lines of the movie by heart. And then I found out that the Tarantino purchased, the Tarantino has a, his own copy, 35 millimeter copy of Ninja 3, The Domination oh, wow. in his collection. And, and we, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what happened to this, this movie. In my, my opinion, unbelievable. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Um, here, here's, an, here's a cool comment, by the way, from Klaus Vergara. He said, I discovered American Ninja 1 last year. Really love it. It's my favorite action movie from the Canon films and the eighties. So that's interesting because, you know, that movie is like a good 40 years old, roughly. And it just tells you like the impact. So a lot of people grew up watching them and they, they've watched them so many times, but then you got people like him who have discovered it for the first times in love with it. It's really cool. So, so this, this, uh, uh, Mr. Vargara is leading us to the next stage of the ninja evolution, the ninja movie evolution, okay? Because we spoke about the Enter the Ninja, Revenge, that's all, all canon. Enter the Ninja, Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja Three, the Domination. And, and Menachem Golan with this company, they want to make more, more sequels because that's a good money maker. And, sure. and, and the buyers, distributor, we call them buyers all around the world, distributor, they want more and more action movies. In between, I directed uh, uh, Breakin. Canon made two Breakin movies, which made tons of money. They were very, but apparently the, the distributors around the world didn't want any more uh, dance breakdowns, more ninja. So Menachem Golan, again, I, I go to his office, he calls me in, we sit, and he says, I want to make another sequel, number four, but this time I want to make a movie which will be American Ninja. This is the title, and the hero will be American Ninja. Now, this was the craziest ideas of all, to begin with, to initially. Not only that we took this negative character, which is called Ninja in, from the Japanese mythology, and we turned him around to become the good guy, which is not part of the Japanese mythology at all. So this was the first crazy idea. Now we are taking it away from the hands of the Japanese into the hands of Amer American Ninja, you know, like a, a, a Chuck Norris or a new Tarzan, something like this, you know. So, wow, this was a great, you know, revolutionary idea. So, you know, I said, okay, let's, let's do it. Again, we didn't have a script, we didn't have anything. And we created, uh, uh, I will relate to, to, the, to the question, to, to the uh, comment that he said, uh, and but I will jump ahead and we created this character American Ninja and we were sent to the Philippines to Manila to shoot the, to film this movie to to film to produce this movie and we did and we we chose Michael Dudikoff to be the American Ninja to represent the American Ninja the idea and Steve James to be his sidekick and Judy Aronson to be the love interest and while we are filming in in uh, in the Philippines, and at that time that we did not have video, it took three days before me as a director can see the material, two or three days, because we are filming, it goes mm -hmm. to the laboratory, they develop the negative, they print it on a positive, they send it back to us, and only then I can see it. Or oh, not only myself, everybody, but 
for the director, there was a delay of two days before he can see what he did two days earlier. Mm -hmm. Now we are starting to see the material, just the raw material, not edited yet. And we see the charisma of Michael Dudikoff. We see the charisma of Steve James and the, and the bond, the, the, what we call the movie, the chemistry between them. Mm. And I see that the, the love story, the, the scenes between uh, Michael Dudikoff and Judy Aronson, there is a good connection, good on the screen. The magic is happening on the screen. Let's, uh, let's put it this way, from mm -hmm. lack of other words. And we already had a feeling, you know, it's very hard to determine what will happen with the movie. It's impossible to say, oh, this movie will be successful or this movie will not be successful in an early stages. Impossible to predict. But we kind of got the feeling that something special is happening here. So let's jump forward again. We, we finish the filming. We go back to Los Angeles. We put it together. We put the scenes together. And we, we do get this feeling that this is a special movie. Something will happen here. And Canon opened the movie, and it was a huge success. It it puts it puts uh, Enter the Ninja, Revenge of the Ninja, all of them in the shadows. But what's more interesting, this was in the eighties, but American Ninja, for some strange reason, for some chemistry that you know all the stars align, just like the movie. Let's, for example, the first Rocky, let's, mm -hmm. which was low budget, independent movie with no money at all. But it's a classic. It's 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 alive until today. Sure. So thing so happened to American Ninja in the field of action, or in the field of martial art action. It gained some kind of eternal life. It's thirty five more than thirty five years. The movie ah, almost forty. The movie came out in uh, in August nineteen eighty five. This is the mm -hmm. official birthday of American Ninja, <laughs> August. <laughs> and and since then. It does not stop to play in first in cassettes, then on discs, then on uh, stream. Now it's in streaming, and it's still out there, and people are watching it, young people. So there is some kind, some kind of chemistry in this movie, some magic in this movie, which speaks to generations and generations. And I've seen the movies when I see it not long ago, it doesn't look old. It doesn't look, it doesn't have this feeling of stale, staleness. You know, sometimes you watch old movies and say, they, sure. look <laughs> they look like, okay, thank you. It's an old movie. But the American Ninja, no, it has this freshness and the, something about it. The stars, the action sequences, the, the, uh, the plot, the, which is uh, eternal and there are nice, Twists in the plot, very good twists in the plot, and I say I get the same kind of reaction like we just got on the on the, the question. People, very young people, are writing to me, 14, 13. I'm getting emails. That say, we saw it for the first time. <laughs> we fell in love with it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the movie is still alive, and uh, 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 and other people who have watched it hundred times. We estimate, by estimate, you know, we know a little bit through the Director's Guild, etc. I We estimate that more than 200 million people around the world saw this movie. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's huge. Yeah. By the numbers that we know. That's how we estimate, but around the world and through the years, you know, almost 40 years. Uh, now, some people will dispute, some among the movies that I directed, some people will write to me, The Revenge of the Ninja is a classic. It's the best of the best, <laughs> etc. But in general terms, not, not only martial art, in general terms, American Ninja is much more popular than all the other, all the other Ninja movies. Maybe a, a, the only exception will be the Ninja Turtles. Yeah, yeah for sure. Most popular uh, film by far um, that you directed and probably one of the canon's most popular. Uh, here's a question now. What's your favorite movie that you directed and why? Uh, in between... In between, uh, after American, we, we almost go in the chronological, it's amazing. <laughs> we almost are, we are going in a chronological way. When we finished American Ninja, before even it was released, I was approached by Canon and they gave me a script which was called at the time Night Hunter. I did not know that it was a sequel to the, uh, to the movie Invasion USA. I, didn't, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Matt Hunter is the hero. And it was written for Chuck Norris. I didn't know it at the time. It was called Night Hunter. 
And uh, Menachem Golan, the head of the company, asked me, do, you, do I think that this uh, script will fit uh, uh, Michael Dudikoff and Steve James? Because we already knew, we, we had this feeling that they are going to be household names. And uh, I read the script, I was flabbergasted, you know. Th this script was written by uh, James Booth, the actor, the English actor, James Booth. And, uh, wow, I read the script, I did not believe. I did not, I didn't know, but by then Chuck Norris rejected this script already. But I didn't know it at the time, I know it today. He didn't want to do this movie. So I read the script, the script is fantastic. I, I go back, I say, wow, this is perfect for Michael Dudikoff and Steve Jim. perfect. So the company said, okay, go ahead, make it. By then the company was already big. They were making like at least 20 movies, 15, 20 movies a year. So they said, go ahead, make it. The, the story takes place in New Orleans and it's hardcore action, <laughs> really heavy, heavy, heavy on the action sequences. And we went to uh, New Orleans and uh, Louisiana. It's not only in New Orleans, in the bayous, in the swamps, in Louisiana, north of, of uh, and we shot this movie. And the movie, in my opinion, number one, from a pl plot point of view, from a story, is solid. It's very solid. It has a social commentary. It talks about uh, white supremacy. 35 years ago, the writer had already envisioned white supremacy uh, kind of uh, problem. And the action is superb, really. The action sequences are amazing. And so that's that's what I feel among the action movies that I directed, that's the best. I know that American Ninja is much more popular than... Uh, uh, ah. <laughs> and eventually we changed the name to Avenging Force. So it's not the Night Hunter. I said... I, we, I was given as a night hunter, but the movie is Avenging Force with Steve J Michael Dudikoff and Steve James. And more and more people are discovering this movie. It did not have the popularity of American Ninja. It didn't have the ninja gimmick. You know, it was like uh, more like yeah. Southern Comfort uh, in, the, in vain of the, those movies, Mississippi Burning. Uh, but mm -hmm. the action is strong, the story is strong. So among the action movies, I, 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 I feel that this is the best movie I directed. Despite the okay. fact that American Ninja is more popular. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> here's another question from Antonio. Uh, Mr. Sam, your films often feature strong lead characters. Which of your protagonists do you resonate with the most and why? Okay, you're right about it. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of traditional Hollywood movie, movie maker. Movie making. Obviously, I grew up in the 50s, uh, 60s. Okay, that, this is the influence. That's why I, I observe all the uh, Hollywood uh, formula, action movies, adventure movies, uh, World War II movies, obviously Westerns, you know, tons of Western. Now, mm -hmm. within this group of movies that I've just mentioned in the 50s and the 60s, the heroes were always strong protagonists, no question, good guys, bad guys. White hat, black hat, you know, no question about it. Uh, they might have some uh, internal uh, problems, internal doubts, but they always turn out to be the good guys, the guys with the high moral. Uh, or or seeking redemption, moral. right? The, the, the classic seeking redemption. They were really bad, but now they're seeking redemption. Again, but eventually you'll see that they are the good guys. So that's yeah. how I grew up. And this is the cinema that I believe in. And this is the storytelling I believe in. The drama that I believe in, Pro protagonists, antagonists, uh, uh, all kind of obstacle to overcome and eventually bring the justice to light at the end of the movie, the end of the story. So th that's why the heroes in my movies, that's, that's, they look like this. Now, among the movies that I directed, I'll tell you. you know, so all the cases, if you take uh, even Joe Armstrong, which is the American ninja, of course, he has a high moral, he cannot, stay, he cannot see injustice and he must uh, help, uh, you know, wherever injustice occur. He, he must correct it. But among the movies that I directed, there is one movie which is not that popular, <laughs> was not that popular. It's called, it's called Riverbend. It, it was privately produced, not by a company, by some investor. And this movie is a story that takes place in the South of America, in the South, in the 60s. And it's a story about racial injustice, injustice and racial discrimination in the South. And there is a hero, 
it so happened that Steve James plays the hero, Quinton. And a and, uh, story about three soldiers who are coming back from Vietnam and to the South, and they see the injustice, and they decided to correct the injustice in a small town, the town of Riverbend in the South. And, and they go along, and they, they, they because they are uh, officers, veterans from Vietnam, they have the knowledge uh, how to turn the situation around. In few words, the, the plot. And and this hero, Quinton, is 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 the strongest of all the heroes that I, I have directed because it has a strong social uh, uh, connotation. The movie has a very strong social connotation. So so is uh, uh, Avenging Force. Uh, the hero, Michael Dudikov, is fighting the white supremacy group. Okay, But over there in the little town of Riverbend, uh, Samuel Quentin, that's his name, uh, he fights uh, a racial, uh, a real social problem that was in the 60s during the civil rights movement. And uh, the movie was just restored this year or last year into a, a high definition quality. We found one, one uh, not myself, more people are involved in it, uh, uh, one print, it was very hard to find the print and the print was scanned to a high, high definition and he's working uh, Michael Dennis from uh, Real Black uh, uh, the channel uh, Real Black Inc. He's working on restoring it into a high definition DVD and hopefully it will be out and available. But uh, that's the answer. This is the strongest hero that I can think about. Could, uh, okay. Sam, can I ask you a question? It's such an interesting thing you said there. Um, if you look at modern movies, right, and a lot of multi-million dollar movies flopping and flopping, do you think it's they, they don't define the characters well enough and don't define the character within the plots well enough anymore? If you, it, it, what, was your, what would be your thoughts? I mean, it's very interesting what you just yeah. said. And do you think that could be an issue with um, something that's lacking in these failing uh, modern movies? I, I'll tell you, in my opinion, my opinion, not necessarily. Here and there you will see a movie that is very strong. I mean, yeah, we can distinguish between action and drama. You know, you will see dramas which are very, very strong. Our Darkest Hour, story about Churchill. Strong movie. Even Oppenheimer that just came mm, out this yeah, year. The character is well defined, you know. And But in the field of action adventure, my feeling is that the studios are recycling material. They are not thinking about original. Where is, I see the picture of Rambo behind you. Where is their new Rambo? Where is Rocky? Characters <laughs> which are completely new and fresh that we didn't have before. The material is recycled. The same stories, even if they have the new title, it's, you just sit there for 20 minutes. So, well, I saw this plot already, you know. I, I'm seeing mm -hmm. a movie that I saw under another name. And I think this is the problem nowadays. Nowadays, too predictable, right? Too yeah, predictable. Oh, too predictable. Within 25 minutes, you know the ending. You already know the ending. And you know the character. Even, right. I, 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 I dare to say, even the, 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 the movie Maverick, which was very successful, was a huge success. Within 20 minutes, I already knew the entire plot to the end of the two hours. You know, there was nothing fresh, original, like in the original, in the original uh, Tom Cruise movie. With the and you know, it's interesting to say that because we're watching more Asian movies because as Americans, we don't know the historic plot. So they're <laughs> so unexpected and things happen. Your, your mind is like, wow, that was really just unexpected and incredible and bizarre or something. Or, or maybe the cinema, the Korean, let's say the Korean cinema is in the yeah. stage now, in a stage now that they are very innovative. You know, that, that was, this things goes in wave. <laughs> Uh, here in America in the 60s and the 70s were very innovative cinema. Yeah. Uh, very revolutionary. Yeah. New ideas, things you, you, you couldn't even imagine. Night, Night Midnight of the Living Cowboy, Dead, right? You know, Midnight Cowboy suddenly came out. Wow. Remember Where did Night this of come the from? Living Dead? That cheat was a very inexpensive, but it was so, the, the, everything was just so well done. Even today, we still look back at it as something, yeah. as, a, as an icon. Yeah, so we brought the, the we brought the sample of Rocky, which was a low budget, small movies, and uh, but Easy Rider, those those are really very innovative movies. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, going back to Riverbend real quick, Antonio had a question talking about Riverbend uh, starring the late Steve James. Can you share a fond memory of working with such a legendary actor? Yes, listen, I will tell you, Steve uh, was chosen to be an American Ninja by us. He already was in a few movies before, and after American Ninja, he, he made a uh, few movies. Steve, as a character, he was a very nice man, very interesting. He was a martial artist, uh, you know, I guess. Uh, when I met him, he was already a martial artist. And, and he wanted, his, he projected his career in Hollywood. He wanted to be the next American black hero. He wanted to be Shaft. Let's, say, let's put it in simple term. You know, sure. he wanted to be the next Shaft. Not, not in a high dramatic movie. He really liked action. He, he liked action. So this was his trajectory. That's, he was going this way. He was a very nice and gentle man. Uh, uh, collector of cinema, uh, he, he collected uh, uh, black cinema movies uh, 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 from the silent era. Cassettes, DVDs, he has a huge collection of movies, like a thousand movies. And uh, when we made the movie Avenging Force, his part, the part that he had to play was a local political a politician in a small town in the south. Actually, in New Orleans, the, the, not small town in the south. The story takes place in New Orleans. And he he is a, a, a black political uh, character that wants to run to office. And there is a white supremacy group that wants to prevent him from getting into office. So, so was the story that at some point, two thirds through the movie, he has to die, the character. <laughs> They get him, and then Michael Dudikoff goes on a revenge spree. Steve hated the idea. <laughs> As Steve James, he said, I don't want to play a character that dies in a movie. So as I told him, Steve will give you a lot of action. You will show your muscles. You will show your, your might, everything you want. But this is the story. I cannot change the, the story. That's the essence of the story. Okay, he understood it. Uh, actually. And, and he has some beautiful fights in the movie, Avenging Force, uh, especially on top of the ship. There is a, there is a big fight on the a, on a deck of the ship. And we, eventually we came to this. And I told him the death is going to be heroic death. Don't worry. Mm. So he has to run up the fire stairs in fire and save his little kid. And he saves the kid. And he comes down and they shoot him. They kill him and he dies. So he used to, all the time he used to tease me, he said, Sam, you owe me. Listen, I died for you in a movie. <laughs> you owe me. One day you'll have to repay. <laughs> a few years later, the opportunity arise. The opportunity happened with this movie, Riverbend. When the Riverbend mm -hmm. to my, got to my hand, the script, it was a huge script, 160 pages. And I saw the character, there's this character of the officer who comes back from Vietnam, and saved entire city, you know, the population, the black population of entire city. <laughs> and, and they wanted the, the I, I offer, I suggested Steve James to the producers. They liked the idea very much. And, and he came, you know, and we worked in, the, we were in, we were sure uh, the, the movie was done in a small town in Texas, not far from uh, Dallas, Waxahachie, Dallas, uh, Waxahachie, Texas. And we were there in the, Texas and, together in a hotel and every time Steve told me, okay, you came through with your promise <laughs> to resurrect my God. So I, he was a fun guy. And, and, you know, we spent time in, in the Philippines, American Ninja, then in South Africa, American Ninja number two. Then I was with him in Louisiana for Avenging Force and eventually in Texas for Riverbend. He was a great man. And uh, one anecdote I can tell you about him, uh, which is really cute. In every movie that I worked with him, or action movie, at some point, he will tear up, without, not scripted, in the middle of a fight or something, he made the, his own decision, he would tear off his, his shirt and throw it away. <laughs> I asked him, Steve, what are you doing? I mean, it's not in the script. I did not ask you to tear. He said, I, he told me, Sam, listen, 
do you think, am I crazy? I'm working so hard on all those muscles. I'm not going to show them. Are you crazy? I have to show those muscles. It's too much hard work. <laughs> Man, Dan, Bruce Lee, they all did it. <laughs> well, yeah, obviously. David, I saw many of your pictures without the shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, um, I'm working um, so hard. Are you kidding? <laughs> well, I, ha I have my ripping shirt off scene in this movie, Bloodstorm, which was my idea. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's an iconic uh scene like that but so um, riverman was too much to tear off the shirt so he cut off the sleeves there is a scene that he's cutting off the scene the sleeves he said that's how we used to do it in vietnam <laughs> another scene with the with no unbuttoned mm. <laughs> hey, uh, so my uh, last question uh david uh real quick uh what would be a character that's missing nowadays that that should be the, if you could have an ideal character for this period of this time right now, what what would you create? What would that character look like that you think would have an impact on this generation? Is this for David or for me? Oh no, that no, for you, that's for you. Your well, question. Maybe David, maybe okay, for David okay. to be Listen, that character. In, in my age, my when I was a kid, the character has to be, you know really influence young people. You don't influence older viewers. That, that's uh, when I was a kid. We had Tarzan. Tarzan was the big thing, you know. Sinbad the Sailor and Tarzan were the two big heroes. In the Western, there are many heroes. And uh, nowadays, of course, obviously, without our control, the heroes are the superheroes, all the Marvel heroes. Mm -hmm. So the, the, they are their current heroes. I cannot point anything to you. We don't have any more Rambo. We don't have Rocky. We don't have uh, any of those that I can tell you the classic. We don't have Chuck Norris anymore. So, uh, McQuay, McVay. so the heroes are the heroes of the of the superhero movies of the uh, cartoon so, uh, Superman, Spider-Man, Iron Man uh, <laughs> not being a fan of those of this genre to me they all look the same but I'm, I'm sure they are not are you saying uh, David's got to become a superhero? And, <laughs> and, and there is a little twist here which is political I must tell you in the 80s most of the heroes were the outcome of the defeat in Vietnam. There is a little mm -hmm. deeper, there, there is a psychological uh, a level to the heroes of the 80s. All of them, think about it. If you think about it, if you take Chuck Norris, if you take uh, even Schwarzenegger, which was not American, if you take Michael Dudikoff, uh, Joe Armstrong, or any of them, they were correction, definitely Chuck Norris, correction to the defeat in Vietnam. So now we are creating a, a, a okay, Vietnam is beyond us. We, we was not so successful Vietnam. We, we did a mistake. We made a mistake in Vietnam. Now let's correct it through the popular culture, through stories, mm. through movies, through television, and we'll create the new American hero that will put Vietnam behind it. So if missing in action, Chuck Norris, if you only send it, you know, the only solution for Vietnam was if you send Chuck Norris to Vietnam. Then everything would have been different. Or the Green Beret, which is a little bit earlier, before uh, the 80s. So, so there is the psychological uh, level. That nowadays, there is, I don't think there is anything that we are looking to either... Uh, we are in a different era right, right now, which is kind of... Uh, we are looking inward in ourselves and we say what did we do what was unjust is uh, slavery was not a good idea you know nowadays we are looking and say wow well, slavery was a bad thing you know uh, uh, everything before the civil right movement was bad so we don't have i don't think we have the 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 basis to create a new hero popular hero which will will arise it might happen it might happen but so far it did not so uh, we are resorting to the world of fantasy, which is the world of the superhero. In another world, you know, Superman, Spider-Man, they are, they are uh, uh, acting in, in a world of fantasy, not in the real, our world. In, in, uh, and not dealing with real problem, but rather imaginary uh, uh, dilemmas and problems. So maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I had a better, <laughs> better answer. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I mean, I guess you could tie in some modern hero dealing with um, 
stuff that led to the pandemic and the shutdown and all that kind of stuff. And maybe even AI in the future, you oh, know, uh, which will You're probably correct. take over. <laughs> correct. Correct. Um, you no, know, we kind of had that something similar with Terminator, I guess. But a popular hero, popular hero needs a basis, needs, needs something that the audiences, the masses, the people, the crowd feels, oh, he's saving us from this it, problem. It, it, it makes sense. And when you talk about Vietnam, you can't help but think about Stallone and Rambo, especially Rambo First Blood Ooh. Part Two, when he says, do we get to win this time? And he goes in and, you know, gets the POWs. It's so good, man. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, here's a, here's a cool question from Antonio. Uh, he said... The day we met and for the sake of the dog showcase your early work. How do you think your style has evolved since then? Okay, you're right. You're mentioning now two movies which are not action movies. Uh, totally not action movies. When I started my uh, work, uh, my career, let's say in cinema as a film, as a student, I envisioned myself as making, maybe directing uh, social redeeming movies, dramas. I didn't know that I will end up on action. So, of course, one evo evolution that you might uh, notice is just the professionalism. The more you make of everything, you know, I, it doesn't matter if you make uh, shoes or carpentry or movies, you're getting better and better at the craft, mm -hmm. at, the, at the craft part of it. And of course, there are here and there, there are geniuses that come from nowhere and boom, you know, Quentin Tarantino, he doesn't need, to, you know, his first movie was already genius. But he, the usual ways, so I am evolving, or I was, I'm not directing anymore, uh, on the craft of making movie. So more and more, you know, how, how do you cut, how do you predict the editing, see what, which pieces of action may work and which pieces of action uh, are not exciting, which are the, so, so it's hard to compare, very hard to compare, uh, the two movies that you're mentioning, Anthony, which are dramas, which are not action at all, to uh, uh, to to action movie, because my, my evolution in cinema was not dramatic movie. I, I wasn't making a better dramatic movie and a better dramatic movie. I was just, I, I was diverted into career that developed to my lifetime career, which is dealing with action movies and spending my life in action movies, my career. Uh, here's another... Uh question from antonio uh we, we both know a little bit something about this um uh mr sam do you think canon films will ever make a comeback no i don't think so uh no anthony listen and everybody there was if you look at the history of uh, hollywood i'm not talking about other type of filmmaking i'm not talking about india i'm not talking about hong kong hollywood so if you study the history and the evolution of, of uh, the cinema of Hollywood, there is some kind of trend. You can, you can follow what is happening. The silent movies, the comedies, the early movies, etc., etc. Now, there was a section right there, which was called, it was mentioned already here, which was called the 80s and the early 90s. In the 80s, in the early 90s, there was a financial situation that just historically occurred. And this was the appearance of the home video market. Mm -hmm. This is something new. It was never before. When you wanted to see a movie before the, the year 1980, you had to go to the cinema or wait until they show it in television. You know, the, the movies used to play in cinema Nine months later, they will show up as the movie of the week or whatever in the television. Or if you fly, if you fly, you can see the movie in the airplane. So this was the, the three ways you can see movies. Either you go to the cinema, you wait until they show it on television, or you see it in the airlines, maybe in ships. Suddenly, something new emerged. This was the VHS cassette. VHS cassette was a revolution. So, uh, and at the same time also, uh, uh, not the streaming, but the cable TV kind of was the beginning of cable TV that you could see the movie without commercials, let's say. But still in a way of television way. You sit at home and you, you see the movie. Suddenly a new media arrived. It was the cassette. 
the cassette was something that you could take home. You buy a cassette player, you put the cassette in, you watch the movie, you want to go to the bathroom, you pause, you go to the bathroom, you come back, you play, you continue. Uh, you're tired, you can continue the movie tomorrow. There was a whole new world here. And at the same time, rental the cassettes were purposely expensive. They sold it, the studios purposely sold the cassette uh, expensive, not cheap, despite the fact that it was very cheap to make them physically. But uh, emerge, what emerged was those all those uh, uh, corner block stores which were renting out cassettes. <coughs> and this became cultural phenomena. You know, Friday, everybody, the family goes to the store, they choose three, four, five cassettes, they bring it all, they have uh, material for the weekend. Now, this was the beginning of the 80s. Studios did not pay attention to this new emerging market. For them, they will stay the same formula for them was in their mind, the, the major studios. Cinema, television, airlines. And lately, the, the cable business. But they didn't pay attention to the cassette. To the, uh, and this was called the home video market. Mm -hmm. So new young companies uh, popped up. Canon, Corelco, uh, Shapiro Glickenhaus, many companies, and they cashed in into this market. They made movies especially for this market. They made movies that sometimes did not play in theater at all. They went directly to the cassette and directly to the rental shops. And the people who came in the, in the, into the store, they discovered new movies through this rental shop without, go, without seeing them, neither in theater, not in television. And this generated a lot of money. And through the entire 80s, for 10 years or more, 14 years, those small companies cashed in on this market. Suddenly, in the middle of the 90s, let's say 1995, around there, the studios woke up and they said, wait a minute, why are they making the money and we are not making the money? We can make the same type of movies they are making, but better, bigger budget. And they made True Lies, for instance, the movie True Lies, which Schwarzenegger and... Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. And now you have the same type of movies that we made, but much better, higher quality, but the same movie, Predator, for instance. Mm -hmm. And they took the market back to them, the studios. And all those companies, Canon, Corelco, Shapiro, Glickenhaus, Crown Entertainment, they all went out of business. Mm -hmm. This is economy. This is reality of economy. Now the studios have evolved, you know, they started to make these movies bigger, 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 until they reach what we see nowadays, which is the superhero, the huge movies, Superman, this huge Spider-Man movies. They don't make anymore those kind of movies, you know, like for them, it was a low budget movies. For us, it was a high budget movie. So I don't see comeback to this era because nowadays the economy with this, and then a new a new kid in the block, which is streaming, which did not mm -hmm. exist in the 90s, in the 80s, in the 90s. And today, streaming di dictate what will happen. If you cannot put your movie in a streaming, in a good streaming situation, you will not make money. So theater nowadays is just prelude for the streaming, just a teaser for the streaming. And, uh, and it started earlier, uh, you know, even in the beginning of the 2000s, already theaters were only a teaser for the people to buy cassette and to buy discs and to rent. And to, uh, so today streaming is the king, streaming the the, uh, dictate what will happen. And in streaming, they don't have the money to the mid-sized budget because our movies were called mid-sized budget. We made, we made movies for 2 million, 3 million, which equivalent to today, six, seven, eight million. There is no market for this. So either they make huge event movies, $200 million budget, or very small movies, artistic, family, drama for one million, one and a half million. That's it. So those movies, in my opinion, will not come back, but it's hard to predict the future. Okay. What well, what about like brand value, for example? I know the late Menachem Golan's nephew, for example, is trying to bring back Canon films. Yeah, I I don't know that 
if it will come, and there are companies, you know, there was a new image and they are kind of going out of business. Okay. They made the same type of movies that Canon made, sure. but for lower and lower budget, the budget had to go down and it was, uh, uh, it was dictated by marketplace. It's not because they were only because they were stingy. <laughs> there was no choice. You couldn't give it. You couldn't sell it to the, to the streaming anymore for the amount of money that is needed to recoup the investment. Mm. So that if there is a second Canon, if there is a new image, if there is Millennium, they make it for smaller and smaller and smaller budget. My friend uh, Isaac Florentin, he directs uh, martial art movies. <clears throat> sure. The budget is shrinking. We used to shoot movies nine weeks, eight weeks. He's now he he's shooting movies for five weeks. Yeah, that's crazy. It's shrinking, yeah. and co uh, the consequences is that there is less and less action within the ninety minutes. You see mm. less action. Action is expensive. Drama is cheap. People sitting and talking, walking and talking, that's cheap. Creating action is expensive. Uh, it takes my, it needs money. So this, yeah. is the, this is what we see. Yeah. Let's see what happened. Um, <laughs> hey, here's a, here's a question. We talked about this when I interviewed you before. I want to see if you got any update on this. It's, it's always been kind of a mystery. Um, uh, Movie Nader says, Sam, are you in touch with David Bradley. We don't hear from the man anymore. Is there any new information about what he's doing today? So David, you and me, we made a little program once about what happened to David Bradley. Yeah, that was a popular video. <laughs> we, <Yeah. laughs> we dedicated one program to this subject alone. What happened yep. to David Bradley? I can tell you what I know. I don't know much. Number one, and this is the most important. We'll start with this and I'll finish with David Bradley. I directed a movie once. I directed David four times in four different movies. Uh, the first one was called American Samurai, then Cyber Cup, Cyber Cup number two, and uh, Bloodsport with Frank Zagarino also. So I, well, I, I was introduced to David Bradley by a company that was present. After Canon, there was a company called Global. It was the same people, more or less. And they wanted to make a movie kind of... Uh, first, we, uh, I directed for them a movie which was called uh, Delta Force Number 3 because they had the rights to Delta Force. They inherited the right to Delta Force. And then they wanted to do something like American Ninja, but with a new title. They couldn't use American Ninja. That belonged to MGM by then already. So they came up with this new idea, American Samurai. <laughs> I would, uh, they knew David. I didn't know David. They introduced me to David Bradley. David Bradley is an accomplished martial artist. He, he was already involved in uh, uh, American Ninja something. And we went to, uh, we, shot, we were filming it in Israel. And we, we made this movie, uh, American Samurai, is, which is not, it's kind of the same idea like Bloodsport. It's in, in an arena. A big chunk of the movie takes place in an arena with fights, mm -hmm. different type of fights. This movie, let me tell you a little bit about this movie and then I'll tell you what I know about David Bradley. This movie, when I finished the filming and the editing, it went back, I was then busy, I went on another project and I was busy and the, the finished movie, the finished editing went back to the company, to this company Global. This was the name of the company, Global Film. And for some reason, I was not around, I was busy with other movies, for some reason, they did not believe in the plot. They thought that the, the, the way I, I directed the movie and the way the script was written was too complicated, too sophisticated for our audience, which I mm. totally disagree. I think that our action audience is very sophisticated audience. And what they, they uh, usually in action movies and the movies I directed, the story is not linear. Some big action happens in the beginning. You, you still, as an audience, you don't understand why the hero doing what he's doing. And as the movie goes along, the secrets are revealed, like peeling uh, the leaves of an onion, the, the layers of an onion. The, the, the people believe that this is too sophisticated and they simplify the movie. They decided to tell the story linear. So they took the movie apart, reconstructed it in a linear way. Yeah. Once upon a time, there was a little boy and, 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 and so on and so on until the revenge, the, the ending, with the, there was a dispute between him and his brother. It's a dispute. Uh, movie and I was and and to do this they had to 
to shoot a few more scenes, not with the main actors. They, they were already out of contract. So they, they added a scene with a little boy. And, and to my dismay, they added a sex scene. Usually in action movies, we don't have sex scenes. <laughs> you don't need, there is enough excitement in action movies. You don't sure. need. So they added a sex, scenes, a sex scene with so-called the actors, but with doubles, because the actors were the main actor, David Bradley, and the actress, they were not there anymore. So they did it with doubles. It looks horrible. <laughs> and they didn't like the final uh, uh, fight. The, the, the villain is uh, Mark Dacascos. Mm -hmm. David Bradley is the hero. Mark Dacascos is the villain. And of course, the, the final battle, the climax is the battle between them, the good and the evil. And I had certain ideas the producer didn't like, and they added material with doubles, not with mm. actors. It looks horrible. Everybody that saw the movie, it was obvious that the, it's not the, the real sure. actor uh, yeah. fighting and, and so on. It's, it's mainly a sword fight movie, uh, uh, weapon movie. So not long ago, uh, a guy from Canada, Lil Goodwin, Lyle, Lyle uh, Goodwin, took upon himself to try to reconstruct the movie to the original form, to the way mm -hmm. it was. We were looking, he, he, he collaborated with me, or I collaborated with him, and we were looking for a script to find maybe one copy of a script, maybe we can reconstruct the movie. We could not find any script, original script. Even my script is probably was left in his mind, I guess. But I told him, Lyle, I have pretty good memory. Let's reconstruct it for my memory. Okay, and so we did. He's still working. He didn't finish. He's reconstructing. He, you know, of course, we threw away the sex scene that is unneeded in an action movie, and and uh, uh, reshuffled the the story point to the way it was in the original script. And I hopefully not long from now he will be able to show it. We will be able to show the movie to the fans, and. Uh, you know, the glory, I, I call it the glory of the original movie. The, the way it's supposed to be, especially the final fight without the, uh, the sex and, uh, and so on. Now, David, back to David Bradley. We have here another David. We have two Davids. <laughs> and, and after I, I, I made the, the, the two movies with him in South Africa, Cyber Cup and Cyber Cup number two, and in, in uh, Indonesia, we made the movie Blood, uh, uh, Blood Warrior with uh, Frank Zagarino. And then we were very friendly. He lived not far from me. And then kind of our, uh, our contact were disappeared. You know, I couldn't find him anymore and he was not around. And uh, then a few years later, he calls me one day and uh, I speak with him on the phone. I said, David, where have you been for one and a half, one year, two years? I, have, I haven't seen, heard from you. He told me, I was in Jerusalem for two years. I said, hmm. this was strange. Well, what are you doing in Jerusalem for two years? He said, I was studying with the, it was a little bit vague. You know, he was studying with some people of, of uh, spiritual people. And then I never heard from him again. Now, David, has, he has a Facebook page. There is a David Bradley Facebook page. Now, just for your knowledge, this is not his real name. His okay. name is Bradley Simpson, mm -hmm. his real name. You know, so David Bradley is a stage name, let's call it. So his real name is Bradley Simpson. And he disappeared. And I know that at some point he was teaching martial art in college, in some college in North America. To my biggest surprise, and I cannot vouch for it, I don't know, but so, many people are, you know, obsessed with this uh, question. Somebody posted that he's a pastor and has his own church in somewhere in Texas. Maybe it's true. I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> he, he's, he's mis he, he, he maintains this mystery. He doesn't put, he does not put in his uh, Facebook page any information here here and there he will answer people on question but nothing about where he is what he's doing so it's a mystery we don't know
<laughs> yeah, I think we'll maybe we'll figure it out someday cuz there's a guy that I talked to on Instagram from uh some European country and he's a huge Canon Films fan and all that and he had a couple discussions with David Bradley, you know, from the Facebook page that he that he showed me and he mm -hmm. asked David, "Hey, would you go on the Viking Samurai channel for like an interview?" And he said, "Oh, I might do that someday." But that was like over a year ago so who knows but but he's aware of the channel he i'm sure he's seen the video that we did together sure, um, sure. Yeah, but, yeah. you know everybody loves a good mystery <laughs> but that's nice uh, just to keep a mystery is also good that's <laughs> true, also good that's true. <laughs> it might be more interesting if we never find yeah. out <laughs> um but that's interesting about american samurai um you know the sam first resurrection that, so for everybody to know so we created in facebook we created a group which is called the official resurrection site of the American Summer Resurrection. And there is a new trailer, which looks good. And uh, I don't know if we will be able to, to bring up the quality of the video because it's very hard. You need the print to move, the, to move up the quality. Sure. It's, it's, it's impossible from a certain video quality to up it to a yeah. higher quality. It's impossible. And so you know, in the print, so maybe one day we'll find a print to, to do a 2K, 4K. I don't know if it will be, but it will be available as a as so called the direct so called the director cut, the original cut. Oh, that's cool. Uh, oh, here's a here's a funny comment from Richard G. Said David yeah. is a ninja. He's good at disappearing. That's cool. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Hey, so a real interesting Sam comment here. I would love to see a ninja movie like because I'm a huge fan, by the way, of the 300. Uh, that would be oh, yeah. really neat where they do all these. It's a small group, but they use all these secret ninja skills as this little group to fight off this massive army. You know, those types of things are always like, you know, no, of course, you, know you go back to the original to Seven Samurai, you know. <laughs> This is the, the original idea of small group fighting a huge group. The Seven Samurai by Akira Kurosawa. Uh, well, it might be an excellent idea. I don't know. <laughs> they can't wear their tops, though. That's the thing. They got to show their muscles up. That was like the thing, I think, for the 300. The guys were all ripped and looked like they could yeah, do that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Right? So the guys are going to have to rip their uh, black costumes off <laughs> one last question sam because i know you got to run we're, yes. we're about out of time here right. um right. if if given the opportunity like would you want to direct a film again or you're directing days like you're satisfied they're over or do you want to do like one last film perhaps uh, okay david the type of movies that i directed it's kind of the we can say that the rug was pulled under my feet I was making a certain type of movies, directing certain type of movies, which were what we call the mid-range budget. So they were not little skimpy movie. They were not, it was nice budget. Uh, uh, Breaking to Electric Boogaloo looks fantastic. Avenging Force look fantastic. The first American Ninja, the second American Ninja. There is the look. And I could fulfill my promise. My promise to my audience was always 45 minutes of action. You are going to see 45 minutes or more of action out of the 90 minutes. So don't worry. You are going to get a lot of thrill. It's impossible to make it today. This is number one. Because I told you, the budget, etc., cetera, et cetera, It's it's uh, This is number one. Number two, the new movies. The movies of today are uh, directed to audience which were grew up on video games. It's mm, a different sure. approach, different filmmaking. You have satisfy you have to satisfy the kids who grew up on video games. Mm. I'm not from the generation of video games. I I'm, I I don't come from that. And the last one, <laughs> directing movie is a hell of hard work. <laughs> it's a 16 days hours every day of work. You know the director is the first one on the set. He's the last one to leave. He has to go to the office, more meetings, watch the dailies, make decision. In the weekend when everybody rests, he goes to the editing room and works. It's, it, I'm, I'm talking, I'm not talking about some drama or three people are talking in a restaurant. Sure. <laughs> That's a lot of work. A lot hard, of work. Hard, hard work. So combine all of this together that it, I don't want to get into this 16 hours work every day and commitment. <laughs> Of, uh, for 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 the director, it's nine months. 
eight to nine month a movie. You know, the, and the responsibility. Remember, David, you are in the movie business. You know, everybody on the set has a job to fulfill. One job, cinematographer, uh, wardrobe. There is only one man on the set, including the producer, that has the responsibility to make sure that there is a movie at the end. Everybody yeah. disappears when they when they finish the job. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> there is one man, a woman, who are responsible to see that there is a story. There is so the responsibility, the pressure. Uh, not to say that I don't have the energy, but I'm almost 75 years old. <laughs> mm. So yeah. I don't think so. I don't not okay. not this kind of movies. <laughs> you know, some, uh, some dramatic movie where, where the drama the drama is uh, is the important thing and the and the acting which is easy to do that's that's nowadays with the equipment that exists today is very easy to make a movie uh, but not an action movie with no without money yeah it's, that that's that's a that's daunting a, task uh, exhausting work long days like you so said so it's well. nice to see to to leave the legacy like this it's oh, very for sure. nice. And I'm very active in preserving the legacy. Very. That's active. great. Yes. Yeah, speaking <laughs> of which, thanks myself, so much. Know, I like the, the. I like the. You know, we are mentioning Toby Hooper and uh, Ledich, Sheldon Ledich, and all the other directors, or uh, Steve Carver, and all the you know Joe Zito, and all the other directors who were together with me in this group of the uh, genre movies of the '80s and the '90s. Oh, speaking of preserving the legacy, do you want to? Talk about do you have your book with you? Yeah, you let me show you. Talking about preserving the legacy. So so not long I'm uh, sorry, not long ago, uh, 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 um, uh, reporter by the name of Marcus uh, 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 not Marcus Mark Sid uh, 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 German reporter Mar uh, Mark Mark oh, Marco Okay, let it go back to it. Oh, Marco Siedelman, a German reporter and a book writer, he came up with the idea to write a book about the movies directed by Sam Furstenberg. And the, and the result is this huge book <laughs> of stories of and photos. And it's called Stories from the Trenches. And this title comes really from Menachem Golan. Menachem Golan used to say, every independent low-budget movie is like a battle in a war. Mm -hmm. You go out and you fight a battle and to see that it will come to fruition. It was a war every, every movie. So out of his uh, saying, I, can, I suggested this uh, title, Stories from the Trenches. And Marco Siedelman agreed to this title. And uh, he took like three or four years to come up with this book. Wow. So if anybody interested, it's uh, available in Amazon, Stories from the Trenches, the movies of Sam Furstenberg. And yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely get that book from Amazon.com, guys, while you're there. Pre-order The Last Kumite, which uh, is selling really good. Uh, it's sold out actually in Germany, funny enough, but I think they're going to issue um, more prints because people really want the media book version of it. And then you could also... It, it, did great in Asia. And of course you can order it in the UK and us. So get Sam's book and get the last Kumite movie when you're on Amazon. Yeah, and, and we have, a, 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 I do have a, a Facebook page and there is a fa Facebook page, uh, the, the battlefield, the cinema of Sam Furstenberg. And the most, uh, maybe the most interesting is a YouTube channel. Okay. With a lot of interviews, including your interviews. So it's a Sam Furstenberg YouTube channel. That uh, has a lot of interviews. Sam, you gotta watch the last Kumite, by the way, because it it kind of it, it's that kind of film that Canon would have made back in the day. It's like blood sport. It's like you know, it, it's an homage. It's got that feel. It's got that kind of music and a lot of those actors. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I will, I will. I know about it. I know about it very well. I, I think yeah. the producer actually reached out to you to put. Yeah, yeah, David. Yeah, yeah. Sean, Sean David. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, funny absolutely. enough. Yeah. yeah. And I, I will. I definitely will. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I gotta much. talk to you after you watch it. I want to I want to get to all hey, your thoughts. Hey David, is this true? Just like David Hasselhoff, the Viking samurai is big in Germany. You are hey, on the heels it, man. Of David because a, a German company is putting out a special edition of Bloodstorm, plus the last Kumite is having his premiere on April 27th. 
you know, maybe my name will blow up over there because I got a German last name anyway. So who knows? Yeah. He's right. huge. David Hasselhoff is a his yeah. He's singing, a king in Germany, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's we huge. both have German names. Furstenberg is a German name, and your name also. Yeah, that's, for that's sure. Yeah. All German here. Yeah. I'm just Scottish <laughs> on my dad's side, so my last name's Robinson, but my mom's full blooded German. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Terrific, guys. Well, Sam, thank you so much for joining. This was a lot of fun, sharing a lot of great stories. And I know you got to run. You got another uh, podcast to do shortly. So you're a busy guy for serving the Zeiglesi, which is great. Kurzhal. What is Kurzhal in German? Kurzhal. Kurz. I don't know. First is a prince in German. Furstenberg is a prince of the mountains. Oh, prince of the mountains and cinema too. Berg. You know, like Goldberg. Berg is okay. a mountain. And for, uh, but there are many uh, people with the name starts with Kurtz. Many, yeah. I have a good friend also. Uh, okay, cool. I think Kurtz is short. I'm not sure. It's small or short? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> now the only thing, David, if you need pictures, if you need photos, I can send you a link for the uh, Dropbox. There is photos if you want to use or anything. Oh yeah, just email me that. That'd be great. Okay, so I'll send you a link through the email. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sam. Oh, just Thanks so you know, I good. looked it up. It means belt buckle or course hat, belt or top hat. Well, maybe I'll sell belt buckles and top hats. Shokasugi used to sell these buckles with, <laughs> really? yeah. with a ninja star in it, probably. <laughs> yeah. But all right. Okay. Thanks, Thank everyone, you, for joining. We'll be back next Saturday. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Thanks. Brian. Bye, guys.